morning. Welcome to Battleground this morning. Take your copy of God's Word. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. As we're working our way through this really pinnacle of Romans and some even say of, of all of the New Testament. But we're getting to some of the, the good things, even the foundational things of your salvation. And, and so I've, I've just been excited and on the inside waiting to get to this section of, of Romans. And so it's just such a, a privilege as I have seen uh, firsthand as we went uh, to, to the western North Carolina mountains and, and helped of, of God's providence and how it works. We talked about that last week. And we have experienced it. We're having a brief meeting right after church to debrief on our trip to talk about how what I what we saw and also how we can help and so I invite you just to hang around for a few minutes after so stand with me Romans 8 the next few weeks we're going to be slowly working through verses 29 and 30 I'm really just studying five words this morning but let's read it all this morning Romans 8 beginning in verse 29 says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified this is the word of God let's pray Lord, there is such good news here for those who are rejoicing this morning, for those who are suffering. There is simply things that are true about us that nothing in this world can change. And so we rejoice in that this morning. We came here this morning to be encouraged as your people so that we may have hope and assurance and confidence in you, hope, confidence. Amen. You can be seated. So this section of Scripture is called the golden chain of salvation. There is a daisy-chained doctrines here that leads to the explosion of one to the explosion of another. Its purpose is not to confuse you. His purpose is not to give you ammunition so you can go on some arrogant YouTube page and, and voice your disgust over someone you don't agree with. It's here for the church's upbuilding. It's here for our assurance, for our confidence, for our joy. The hope, just look at your notes, look at the title, the hope of being foreknown. Here's, the reason I named it that was not this. Well, I hope I am. I hear that a lot amongst people who believe that they hope that they're saved. They hope one day that the balance beam... What? It's not biblical hope. That's no hope at all. It's biblical hope. These are things that we know to be true. I've said it multiple times. It's got to give us multiple opportunities to share the gospel as we, as we go to different places and talk to different things and even volunteering yesterday with the, with the city. I had a chance to share the gospel with someone I was serving beside. There are simply things that is true precisely because Jesus is resurrected. If Jesus is resurrected, there are things I can count on this morning that are true. Everything that Jesus ever said was true. Everything in Scripture is true. And I can stake my life on it because He lives. This is what we know. This is what our hope is on. But look, can I ask you a question this morning? When you hear the word doctrine, what comes to mind? Now, be honest with yourself. Yeah, right? Ugh. Yeah, that's right. I've, I've got that down. I think I had ugh. I didn't know how to spell ugh. E-W. But I got also, and this is me, just so you know where I'm at in the, in the three. There's some people that are sitting there going, ugh. I'm going like, woohoo. Ah, yeah, I've been waiting on this. 
And then there's other people that are just saying this. Meh. Yeah, you know. I guess I got to get through this. It's like going to the dentist, you know. It's necessary. And I don't enjoy it. I hope this troubles us. Acts 2.42. This is the inception of the church. These weren't people who went to seminary. This is what they, listen to what he said. And they, that is the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves to what? The teaching. That word is didache. It means the doctrine. It means instruction. They devoted themselves to it. This is present active. They devoted and they kept on devoting themselves to it. They, didn't, they persisted in it. They loved to be instructed. They loved doctrine. And they gave himself. That word devoted themselves means to give yourself constantly to something. Why? Why was that so important to them? The question is, why is it so unimportant to us? Ephesians 4.14 Lest we forget why the state of the church is so unhealthy. It's because we have forsaken our doctrine. Ephesians 4.14 tells us why it's so important. It says we study it so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. Here's the truth this morning. No matter how you feel about that word doctrine, you are being indoctrinated. You are. What do you think politics is? It's an indoctrination. They are seeking every commercial we watch, every little commercial that comes on to that clip that you're trying to watch on a social media. They are seeking to persuade you. That's what, it, that's what indoctrination is. We always think if you think of indoctrination, you think of a cult over there where they're giving out free Kool-Aid. It's to persuade someone of something. Everybody's being indoctrinated. They teach you something and they give you a place to try it out. They're trying to say our way of looking at life, our way of believing, and our way of living is the best way. See? So the goal of biblical doctrine, according to the Scripture, is to see that we grow up into Christ I don't care whether you adopt my, my opinion what we must care about is what does the scripture say and how is our lives being conformed to it but you need to know right now that they are trying to pull your doctrine out of you and listen they are pulling it out of your kids in the first semester of college here's the goal and if you don't realize that you're being your, your children are being sucked into and you don't even understand it. It's happening at school, it's happening in a high school near you, and it's happening in a college here. Here's their three points. Here is the goal. It's not simply education, and I would say education has been slid over. It is isolation. The goal of them is to isolate your child from the roots of that which they've been raised, and they isolate them. They come home every week, they come home every month, and then they never come home. They isolate them. Then they indoctrinate them into a particular worldview. Every class that your child ever takes that has the word studies on it, African studies, women's studies, whatever, it is not about education. It is about indoctrination. Study it for yourself. And then they're brilliant. You know what they do? They provide them a community. They cultivate it. How do, they cultivate a, how do you cultivate a worldview? I give you a community for which you can practice it. And it is the church who has abandoned small groups because we don't have time for it. We've abandoned our community. We have abandoned Acts 2.42. But listen, the world has not abandoned it. They have cultivated it. And they begin just like Hitler did with the youth. And we better understand it. The doctrine is important. What you believe and why you believe it is important because y'all sitting in the seats, parents and grandparents, are the primary disciples of our children. The main idea today, 
is those in Christ Jesus rest in God's sovereign declaration over them. Listen, that they are loved, predestined, called, justified, and one day they will be glorified in His presence forever. I have no better news for you over the next several weeks than to talk about what that means. So here's the question, no matter how you feel about doctrine this morning, well, how do you approach it? Not just talking about foreknowledge, our, our subject today, our doctrine today, but any doctrine, any teaching that, that just sitting there going, hmm, I never heard that, I'm just never, I don't know, how do I approach that? Well, let's talk about that. Here's the first imperative. We must deal with hard doctrines. We must deal with them because, listen, in the church, whether you attend one or whether you have attended one, there's always two approaches. Ignore it or deal with it. And it is not my purpose this morning to throw any local church under the bus. I've, I've just come to love local churches more this week as we have partnered with people from, 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 from in Newland to here to across town. But listen, topical preaching is a blight on the church. The steady diet of a pastor who preaches whatever he feels like from Sunday to Sunday and what it ends up being, if we're not careful, is what the pastor is passionate about. His bully pulpits and his pet doctrines or politics or whatever it might be that's going on in the world today. His, and he might call it, I just being led this morning. But listen, what God has told us to do and what he has led us to do is to preach all of this. Every verse. So how I keep myself in check and how I keep us moving forward is when I come to a hard doctrine, I don't have the right to skip it. I don't have the biblical mandate that says, people are going to get mad today and this makes you uncomfortable or I don't even know what I believe about this. I'm just going to skip over it. No, i got to deal with it. And I can't ignore it. Listen, pretty shutters on your houses and planting pretty bushes in your yard does not help your house survive the hurricane that's coming. And we can put lipstick on, we can tell you how to meet felt needs, but if these foundations are not in place, when the storm blows into your life, your house will fall. This is important. It is not optional. We must not ignore it. We must deal with it. But how we deal with doctrine... It's important. We must first deal with it humbly. Titus 2.7 Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, same word, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an op opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about you. It doesn't do you good to go on and, and, and spout off at people on social media about some doctrine you're passionate about and then, and then contradict it by how we live. When you disrespect people, and listen, by the way, social media is a terrible place to spout off doctrine. Meet somebody with coffee Love them enough to look at them in their eyes and talk to them. I told a lady this week who called me on the phone and disagreed with something. I've, I've given you 45 minutes of my life. How much more of my life do you think I would give the people that are part of my church to talk about things that we don't agree with? We must deal with them, but we must be humble in the way we deal with them. We must show respect and dignity in the way we handle ourselves. We must deal with them biblically. 2 Timothy, just a, three passages from 2 Timothy. By the way, remember, Paul is speaking to a pastor about how to shepherd his church well. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as, an, as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Why is he not ashamed? Because he's rightly dividing the word of truth. One chapter over in chapter 3 or verse 16 of 2 Timothy. Oh, here it is. How, do, how, should, how should you look for a church? Well, what products do they have? I need to look at the produce. I need to see what they offer me and my family. No, no. You need a church that preaches all of the Word. Why? 
because all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Deuteronomy is in the Word of God because it's meant to be taught. It's meant to be understood and applied into our life. It is not there to skip it. One chapter over again in 2 Timothy it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead by the appearing of and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and what? Teaching. For Listen. It says, for the time is coming. Could we just update that and say the time is here? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away into myths we have preachers that are standing up today right now preaching a, a message of politics trying to get you to vote a particular way rather than giving you a foundation by which you may make good godly decisions that's first that's essential we must be biblical and we must be wise Matthew chapter 7, just the clearest picture of why, why the Word of God and all of it and its doctrines matter. Listen to this illustration. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears the words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The wind and the rain is coming. And the Bible is clear. Listen, doctrineless churches produce spineless Christians. You must Go to a place that's going to preach it all. So we must deal with hard doctrines. And listen, we must understand and know our non-negotiables. Before we even started Romans, we went through what we call the five solas. Us as Protestants have these as non-negotiables in our life. They come from the very inception of the church. Our church began, when church began, many people could not read, so they had creeds. And creedal confessions kept us on the main thing to keep the main thing the main thing. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15. It says, For I delivered you of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried and He was raised on the third days in accordance with the Scripture. That creedal confession, brothers and sisters, goes all the way back to Pentecost when Peter stood up and said, You killed Him and God raised Him up. Repent and put your faith in Christ. That was confessed. That didn't change over, over generations. That was what the church has always believed. And these are our non-negotiables. Listen, there are going to be things in weeks ahead and even months ahead as we go through Romans that we are not going to agree on. But we must agree that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And the Scripture is our ultimate authority of how to live our life. And if we believe those things, then I can sit up here and have a conversation with you or at the coffee shop about something that we may not agree on, but we can hug each other as brothers and sisters and move on for the glory of God and the mission of God. But we cannot ignore doctrines when we run into them because we might not agree with them. Here's what we all agree on. We're saved. Not by works. Not by works past. Not by works present. And not by works in the future. Ephesians 2 says that you were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked that you once followed the course of this world, that you once followed the prince and power of the the air. It said that we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Listen, like the rest of mankind. So if you want to know what God looked into the future and saw, that's what He saw. 
A bunch of hell-bound haters of God with His wrath on them that does not deserve grace nor deserve mercy. And the wonder is, we are saved this morning. That's our starting point to look at hard doctrines. We must look at the right things. We must not ignore them. We must know our non-negotiables. But listen, we must ask the right questions. The reason that you do not enjoy doctrine is you have not learned to ask the right questions. How and when does God's plan of salvation? When did it when did it when was it started? How was it achieved? This amazing salvation that we're living in, this reality of being children of God. When did God start that plan? What does scripture mean? When he says in Ephesians 2 that you're dead, that you were dead before salvation. What did he mean when he said, having ears they cannot hear, and having eyes they can't see? What does that mean? What's the implications of that? What did Jesus actually do on the cross? Is salvation just a possibility for some people who have the ability to reach for it? Or is salvation a certainty? In other words, what I'm asking you is to ask the right questions. Are people in this world simply drowning? And we just need to throw them a life preserver so they might save themselves by their good choices? Or do they need, brothers and sisters, a resurrection that only the Spirit of God can do? There's an answer to that in Scripture, but do we believe it? Are we willing to lean into it? To understand it? Do all people have a legal and relational problem with God or just some people? Is faith really a gift from God? Is it really grace? Or is it yours that you have in your pocket and you've got to use it? What really drives all people's choices? Those are good questions, aren't they? The, the question I'm asking with all these issues going on in our life is we care more about that we have a balanced budget than to understand things as foundational as your great salvation. Listen, we must ask the right questions. But listen, you've got to know your culture that you have grew up in. You've got to know your context. And listen, even in this room, I was talking about that with someone, someone yesterday at, at, at the King, in the Kings Mountain Festival that we worked in. You can take somebody that might be the same ethnicity that lives in California and that lives in North Carolina and their cultures are polar opposite from each other. But listen, all of us as Western people have some predispositions. And we have taken those and put them and placed them on Scripture. One is our enlightened sense of fairness. Our belief that when our child plays on a team, that he better get a medal at the end, forgetting that in life there is both people who win and people who lose. And both have an opportunity to learn something from both of it. We have an ego-driven individuality in our culture that takes care of our own while lets our neighbors starve to death. Our false belief is... Here's one. Authentic love must be equally chosen by both parties. It's not real if it's not. Listen, we have dumbed down the salvation of Jesus Christ to a kindergarten crush to where they pass a note to you and says, I love you. Do you love me? Check yes or no. The picture of salvation is, is not that God looked down on earth before He saved people and saw you as a little little innocent baby and it's like oh no the picture of your salvation is adoption and looking and seeing a lice ridden rebellious traumatized person without hope and they don't even think they have a problem and they don't even think they need a savior they think they're doing okay living in the squalor playing with the mud pies as C.S. Lewis said when Christ offered a holiday at the sea that's the picture of salvation. Uh, somebody tell me, do you know the story of Hosea? Remember the minor prophet? Somebody tell me his wife's name. Gomer. What was uh, Gomer's occupation? Can we, the prostitute. 
Why in the world would Hosea marry a prostitute? Come on now. Somebody knows their stories. Why in the world would God tell Hosea to marry a prostitute? Mm, you could preach this message, couldn't you? That, that's the point. Here's the question. You see, I said this last week. Say it again. So I got another story of the Bible. You see, minor prophets are important. They're teaching us something about the greatness of our salvation. So here's the question. If Gomer pointed to Israel and Hosea was a picture of God, if Hosea was a picture of God and Gomer is a picture of you, did Gomer ever love Hosea the way Hosea loved Gomer? You see, our false understanding that only true love must be equally chosen was false from the word go. It was false in the Old Testament, and it is false now. You have never on your best day ever loved God like God loved you. And you wake up every day with His mercies new and His grace new, with His love set on you because of His sovereign grace, because of His sovereign love, not because you loved Him like He loved you. We need to spit that out because it doesn't bring hope and assurance. It just elevates your ego, but it's not true. So if we're going to understand hard doctrines, we have to do those things. But... My, but important today and where the sermon is at today is to understand we've got to define our terms if you speak to someone who is a catholic about justification they don't they're using the same word they don't believe what you believe about justification we got to define our terms before we can even have a conversation so what does it mean what does foreknowledge mean what does it mean for those whom god foreknew that's all we're really looking at this morning. If you look, at, go back to your text there. For those whom he foreknew. That's it. I want to give you two views. By no means the only views. But these are the two view, dominant views when we ask the question, what does it mean? So, so let's look at it. First is the word is simple. It just means to know beforehand. It's not complicated. The word is not, you can almost see it in the word. For knowledge. To know beforehand. To know what? That's the issue. <laughs> to know what? That's, that's where we talk about doctrine. Okay, what does God know? Well, let's just define the word biblically. It means to befriend or to be acquainted with someone in a familiar way ahead of time or before meeting. Read that again. It means to befriend or to be acquainted with someone in a familiar way, even in a family way, ahead of time, before you even meet that person. The definition goes on to say, this implies an exclusive choice of relationship to those who are not befriended. In other words, it is to choose to make a choice to be befriend this group of people, and you make it beforehand. So here's just the question. Now, we, now what we're doing now, remember? Let's ask some good questions. Does your choice come before God's purpose? In salvation, I mean. Does your choice come before God's purpose? Or does God's purpose come before your choice? And listen, by the way, this passage was written to who? The local church. In other words, when God gave this, He said, if you are a spirit-filled believer, you can understand what I'm saying this morning. They could, and you can. These are the questions. Regarding salvation, which comes first, God's choice or yours? So here's the first view. What is foreknowledge? Here, this is the first view. And by the way, this is the dominant view in your day. Even if your preacher never talked about that word. They've told you. They've doctrinated you by the way they preach. So let's just look at it. First view. That God looks through the hallway of time and knows your choices. And then God makes His choice off of your choice. That's one view of what the passage means today. That's called prescient, pre-science, before knowledge. Sees knowing as more of a mental ascent. 
God is looking through the hallway of time and sees Jason's going to make a choice towards me, so I then choose Jason. That's, the, that's that view. The flow is like this. God looks at the hallway of time, sees that you going to choose him so he chooses you and then he predetermines your destiny that you should be called justified sanctified and glorified listen in this view your faith is the cause not the consequence of God's will now think about what I just said if, if God is looking through the corridor of time and he sees your choice and he makes his choice of your salvation based off your choice then your choice is the cause of God's will, not the result of it. That's this view. This view keeps man's responsibility and God's sovereignty both intact. intact. But what this view teaches, that if you're a child of God today, is primarily because God knew that you would choose Him anyway by faith. And by the way, it doesn't matter what you believe about this view. The opposite is true that God looked through the hallway of time and saw that you would not choose Him, so He did not choose you. There's no way to get away from that on any view you take. What's true of one, you have an opposite. Whether you know it or not, most of you have been taught that this is the way God works in salvation. God loves you. Let me just teach you. This is this view. God loves you, and He's got a plan for your life. And all you need to do is pray this prayer. Ask Jesus into your heart. Invite Him into your life. Make Him Lord. What they're saying, what we're teaching is this view that God has done what He can, but He's waiting on you to make a choice. And when you make a choice, He'll make one. All of this, according to this view, happened before the foundation of the world. But there is a second view. <laughs> and I hope by the time I get to the second view, you know where I stand. But I want you to know that these exist. Whether they teach it to you or not, this is what we, that's what people believe. This is one view. There's a second view. That in eternity past, God knows you. And all of your choices come out of God's sovereign purpose. God's foreknowledge comes out of, flows out of God's eternal purposes and plans. In other words, it logically sounds like this. Our purpose, our plans, and our choices flow logically from a Creator's purposes, from a Creator's plan, and from the Creator's choice. In this view, God's foreknowledge is personal. It's about people. It's not merely about their choices. To be According to this view, to be known is to be loved personally. So to be foreknown is to be before loved. God's election, His choice of us, was before any action, past, present, and future. Because our sinful nature makes all of our future actions outside of God's grace wicked anyway. That's what this view is teaching. That without God's grace and His mercy, anything that God would have looked through the hallway of time and saw was that which your wicked nature chooses. In other words, all of your choices come from your greatest desire. All of them. You're going to choose where you eat today because of what you feel like eating. God looks through the hallway of time and sees people that are in rebellion against Him. Foreknowledge is personal, according to this view. Listen to this from a positive J.I. Packer talking about your salvation. It says, no one, now this is a saved person, nobody can produce new evidence of your depravity that will make God change his mind. God justified you, so to speak, with his eyes wide open. He knew the worst about you at the time when he accepted you for Jesus' sake and the verdict he has passed was and is final. In other words, God foreloved you with his eyes wide open. In this view, your faith 
is the consequence, not the cause of God's will. We believe only because we were first loved, chosen before the foundation of the world. The reason you're a Christian, the reason you're a child today, is because you were before loved. When we read in the Bible in 1 John, God loved you before you loved him. When did that happen? Right? When did that begin? Okay, we said that we didn't love him first. He loved us first. When did he love you? Here's what the Bible says. For the foundation of the world, he set his love on you. I know that blows your mind. It blows my mind too. But he's God. Revelation 13 Verse 8, it says, Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given, given it over every tribe, people and language and nation, all who dwell on earth and worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. That there is a book, and it was written... And it was written before the foundation of the world. Those whom he foreknew. When that book. Before God chooses or elects anyone, he must have an object of his choice. And that text tells you what it is. Those whom he foreknew. God does not look through a crystal ball and make His plans around our choices. By the way, this is a horrifying view of God's sovereignty that must be applied if true in your salvation and everything else in your life that God is sovereign over. You really want your choices to be sovereign? Determining God's purposes and plans? Absolutely not. We pray because God is sovereign and He folds into His sovereign economy our prayers to change the world. But God is first, not us. The flow goes like this. God knew that in the future no one would love Him, no one would seek Him, or no one would be able to choose Him. So He, in His sovereign grace, set His love on a group of people called His elect, and then He predestined them to be conformed to Christ, guaranteeing their inward call, their legal justification, their outward sanctification, and their future glorification. You were saved and you were secure because of what God foreknew. And listen to me. Don't give me none of this. The secret things belong to God. God gave it to you in His Scripture. And so it's not a secret. We can understand these things, but listen. We must, above all, no matter which view that you realize that you've been believing or the view that you grab a hold of, we must be devoted to Scripture. We must be devoted. We must ask the question now that you have heard these views. What does the Scripture say? That's ultimately what matters. Because if view one is what Scripture says, we must believe it. But if view two is what Scripture says, then you must believe it. I am not asking you to believe some ism or some ology of some dead guy who had good ideas. I'm asking you to say, what does the Scripture say? What does God's character tell us? What has God done in the past? What is He going to do in the future? What does He say? So here's the question before us. Does God know, foreknow people's actions? Is that what that passage, that, is that what that word means? Or do you know people? Well, let's see what Scripture says. So turn with me into the beginning of this story to Genesis in chapter 4 in verse 1. It says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Adam knew Eve. The Hebrew word is yada. They yadad. The result of yada was children. There's only one meaning of that word, and I don't think I have to spell a picture out of what it means. 
This is not simply Adam saying, I take cognitive recognition that you're a woman and that we would like children. Let's talk about it. No, no, no. They, they knew each other. They yadad. And the result of that was children. This was intimacy. Now turn with me to Acts 2. Remember our question. It's when you study hard passages, you've got to have a good question. Acts 2.23 It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in the, your midst, as you yourselves know. Listen. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. What or who was foreknown? Jesus was. He was foreknown. He was foreknown, and he engaged in God's plan of redemption. They crucified him and by the hands of lawless men because that what was the Father's plan to redeem his children. Jesus was foreknown. Romans 8, our passage for today. Listen to what he says again. And we know that all, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image. Listen, this is a simple question. What did God foreknew? Those he called. His foreknowledge is speaking about you. Romans 11, turn with me three chapters over. To verse 1, talking about Israel here. I ask then, has God rejected his people? His people is Israel. By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Listen to what he says. God has none, not rejected his people whom he foreknew. What did God foreknow? Israel. He foreknew them. He foreknew Jesus. He foreknew you. 1 Peter 1.19 says this, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the light times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him victory so that our faith and our hope was in God. Who or what was foreknown? Jesus was. So now answer your own question. Who or what was foreknown? Their actions or them? God's word says that he the foreknowledge speaks of intimacy, it speaks of a personal knowing, and that everything else that flows comes because of that reality. The conclusion then, your election is not based on God's before seeing your faith. Foreknowledge explains how God set his love on you, so you became the object of his predestining, calling, justifying, and glorifying grace. So we can begin, we can end where we began this morning with Pastor Micah reading Ephesians. Put that question and read this text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Oh, foreknowing is good. But you see, it doesn't do you any good if you do not know how to apply it. What, what's the point? Well, I love to cut wood. And I just got me a new chainsaw. And, and by the way, it's one of them solid orange chainsaws. If you know chainsaws, that's the best kind, by the way. But it's, 
It's, it's one of them, it's the big boys, you know, it's the Tucker boys. They use, they use this when they're trimming the trees. I got me a good one. And listen, here's what I don't do. I don't polish it up, put a new blade on it, and sit it on the shelf and go out there and say, look at that nice chainsaw. No, no, no. I grab that sucker and start it up, and I start cutting stuff. I do, don't I? I go over to your house. I'm going to cut something. Just put it in front of me. Listen, doctrine. <laughs> Y'all know this is true. Yeah, yeah. Doctrine is meant to be used. It's not meant to be put on a shelf. It's not something that preachers sit around with coffee and talk about. It is your life. If you believe that God set His love on you before the foundation of the world, what place is it to not have assurance? What place is it for your life not to have an unquenchable joy that transcends your situation because God has made a final declaration of me? What does it matter what other people think? Where is the fear of man in this when this is true? Why do I care what someone else thinks when God has already made a declaration of His love for me and I am already glorified in the mind of God because He has determined it before the foundation of the world? Our, our understanding of this doctrine produces several things. An obedience to Christ, a love for our brothers and sisters, and our love for our community. God's love swelling up, bubbling up, flowing out into the world. I drove up to Oak Grove in Newland this week, and what I saw was just God's people and people just showering them with so much they didn't know what to do with it. There's stuff laying everywhere. I pulled up to their church building sanctuary like this. Just imagine you come in here to worship Sunday and all of the, there were clothes piled in all of these chairs. All the way out through the hallway out up, up and to outside the door. That was their church. They had not been able to worship the Lord since the hurricane. And people were just bringing things. They had no way to deal with it. So I asked the pastor, can we help you worship this Sunday? My brother had a trailer. We, we unloaded the stuff that you gave, and then we started piling clothes in there. And we cleaned his church. We vacuumed his church. And then, and then those little people, you know, some of them, the older people started coming in. They come looking in, and their church was clean, and they were ready. She said, can I call them? Can I call our people and tell them we're worshiping Sunday? You see... How much you understand the love of God for you will naturally bubble over. We could hardly contain ourselves in the joy we felt to get to serve a brothers and sisters that way. God's love produces this in our life. God's love produces fierce confidence. Listen, it only took 12 men to turn the world upside down. What will God do with you if you understand? that God has set His love on you. Brothers and sisters, do you know that love this morning? Because, listen, the storms are coming, but victory is promised. But we must know how much we are loved. Let's pray. Lord, thank You. Thank You for the patience of Your people. Let me get through the sermon today to explain this glorious truth. And now, Lord, now is our response time to you. We get to respond to you in, through worship. Thank you for music. Thank you for people who, who know how to write music that reflects how our heart feels. Thank you that we get to sing it. Thank you we get to give. Of course, we're a family that has work to be done and thank you that we can give God thank you that every week we come to the table to remember this great salvation that was planned before the foundation of the world Lord we don't have to completely understand it to know that I am saved because of your grace and so Lord we come to the tables now as we crunch the bread in between our teeth and drink the juice we remember the, the body and the blood of Christ that removed your wrath and brought your mercy and adopted me into the family Lord may we celebrate that together individually and collectively that we are the body of Christ that are placed here to accomplish your purpose that you have determined 
So, Lord, may we enjoy you. May those who have never felt the love of God feel it today in a way that they cannot explain. We trust in the power of your Spirit to do these inward things in people's life. So move today. Comfort your people. Rescue the perishing. Do your work, Lord. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. And you come to the tables. Hallelujah.